Good morning, church family. We're grateful for another opportunity to be together online as we're all doing our part to move through this pandemic season. But this morning, as we begin our time of worship together, I want to share a verse with you all. And I shared this passage of scripture earlier this week with the, the praise band, and I was hoping it would bless you also. It comes from Philippians chapter 1, and it's verses number 9 and 10. And I'll be sharing from the New Living Translation. Philippians 1, verse number 9 says, I pray that your love will overflow more and more, and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters, so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. I love that message from the Apostle Paul to the Church of Philippi. It's very relevant to us today. It's so important that we remain focused on what matters most. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we are so grateful for another day to be together. We're grateful for the, the rest we had last night and for the day ahead and for all the blessings you have in store. Father, right now, bless your church family as together all around this world we join together in praise to you. Father, may we continue to be your vessels and may you continue to bless and provide protection for us through this season of pandemic. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. We lift his name high because his name is above every other name. And we give you all glory and praise today and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. I love you all very much.
last week on the church's website, we were able to spend the last week of Jesus's life with him. Uh, there was the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and then Jesus stopped at the temple where he drove out the money changers and those selling items that were sold for uh, sacrifice. And then there were trips back to the temple where he would teach and heal the sick and the lame. And then later on, there was the Last Supper where he would wash all the disciples' feet, including the feet of Judas, who would betray him, and Peter's feet, who would also deny him three times before the rooster crowed. Uh, then came his trip to the Garden of Gethsemane, where he anguished in prayer of his over his impending death. And then was his betrayal by Judas and his arrest and the mock trial and then his sentence to be beaten and put to death on the cross. The chief priests and teachers of the law tried many times to, to catch Jesus up in his own words, but they were always unsuccessful. Well, after his death, they felt like they had finally won. They felt like, well, for once we've, we've put Jesus to rest and we'll never hear any more about him. But they weren't totally sure. Let's read Matthew 27, 62 through 66. It says, this is after Jesus has been put to death. He's been put in his tomb and that's... Uh, this is uh, the chief priest's response to it. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to, went to Pilate. Sir, they said, remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples will come and steal the body and tell the people that he has raised from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. Through Jesus' death, we know that our sins are forgiven. We know that not only our past sins, but our present sins and our future sins are all gone. But, you know, here is the rest of the story. Listen to Matthew 28. 1 through 7. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to, the, to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has been risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. Not only are our sins, are for, not only are our sins forgiven, but Jesus' purpose is complete. The tomb is empty. Take a few minutes to meditate on what Jesus has done for us. Let's take a few minutes and pray. Our Heavenly Father, 
Thank you so much for the divine plan that you had for our lives. Thank you so much for Jesus, for him coming to live here on this earth and to live a life that was without a flaw. Father, we would like to remember what you have done for us. Father, we ask that you would bless these emblems as uh, we remember the death, the burial, and the resurrection, and the tomb that was empty. That's all these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Morning, church. Today's reading comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. So now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the Anointed One. For the law of the Spirit of the life flowing through the anointing of Jesus has liberated us from the law of sin and death. For God achieved what the law was unable to accomplish because the law was limited by the weakness of human nature. Yet God, God sent us His Son in human form to identify with human weakness. Clothed with humanity, God's Son gave His body to be the sin offering so that God could once and for all condemn the guilt and power of sin. So now every righteous requirement of the law can be fulfilled through the Anointed One living His life in us. And we are free to live, not according to our flesh, but by the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit. Those who are motivated by the flesh only pursue what benefits themselves. But those who live by the impulses of the Holy Spirit are motivated to pursue spiritual realities. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset controlled by the Spirit finds life and peace. In fact, the mindset focused on the flesh fights God's plan and refuses to submit to His direction because it cannot. For no, ma for no matter how hard they try, God finds no pleasure with those who are controlled by the flesh. But when the Spirit of Christ empowers your life, you are not dominated by the flesh but by the Spirit. And if you are not joined to the Spirit of the Anointed One, you are not of Him. Now Christ lives His life in you. And even though your body may be dead because the effects of sin, His life-giving Spirit imparts life to you because you are fully accepted by God. Yes, God raised Jesus to life. And since God's Spirit of resurrection lives in you, he will also raise your dying body to life by the same Spirit that breathes life into you. Hey guys, what's going on? This is Pastor Mike here. What's going on, Norway family? Hey, I'm excited. I get the privilege of sharing the Word of God this week. And uh, actually, we're going to be doing a two-part series uh, coming from the hills or where we just came from last week as far as the resurrection of Jesus and how we are going to be uh, looking at how when He died, we all died, and when he was raised, he was raised to glorification. We were raised with him, and now we're seated all at the right hand of the Father with him. This is Adrian. Want to say hi? Say hey. And uh, he actually, we're celebrating his birthday today. He's turning eight years old, and we're so excited about that. So, guys, I want you to tune in to this series. The, the, the series is going to be called The Freedom of the Resurrected Spirit-Filled Life. So, God bless you. Tune in. Get your pen and paper ready, and here we go. Hello, everyone. I'm Mike, the new youth pastor here at Norway Church, and I'm so excited about sharing the Word of God with you today. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Lord for this opportunity uh, to share the Word today, and um, it's just an amazing opportunity. It's a privilege and uh, to be able to share with you. It's just an amazing thing. Um, and also, I want to thank Pastor Jeff and you, uh, the Norway family, uh, for welcoming my family and I. Uh, to this amazing family here at Norway. Um, uh, we're just so honored and we're so blessed uh, during this transition uh, to be a part of an amazing family with great leadership. And uh, we're just so excited about that. Um, and one thing I want to do, I just want to encourage you, especially during this time, this unprecedented time uh, in our history, uh, to continue in prayer for our state, uh, our country, and across the world to, to lift your hearts and your eyes to the Father of Heaven and declare healing to our, to our land and our world. Uh, John 3.16 uh, says it perfectly. It's the, the most famous scripture in the world. It's the most foundational scripture of our, of our time. Uh, and it's for God so loved the world. So it's the world that he has his eyes upon. It's the world that, that he, he looks at because it's the world that he, uh, the earth that he created and the world that he created. Unfortunately, sin came in and, and, it, and it damaged that relationship. But thank God as it promised and as it said that he sent his son so we can be back in right relationship with him. So let's just pray. Let's just pray that, that God begins to move uh, in this country, in this world, uh, through his love and his grace. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. And uh, also, I want to thank you, Mark, 
uh, for reading the word today. Um, that scripture is, is powerful in my heart and dear to my heart. Uh, there's so much meat, though, uh, so much meat and sustenance in the in that uh, chapter itself. Uh, but I really want to focus on mainly just uh, uh, Romans chapter two. Uh, I mean, excuse me, Romans chapter eight and verse two. And, and it says this for the law of the spirit of life flowing through the anointing of Jesus has liberated us from the law of sin and death. Uh, that word liberated means to be released from. So, so living in the life flowing spirit of Jesus, uh, he releases you from the grip of the sins possession and the enemy's occupation. Because some of us was working for the enemy for such a long time, but thank God through the blood of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins, he released us from that oppression. Uh, that the enemy had us in. So, uh, and not saying that the oppressor won't still come and still try to suggest things and still try to tempt us, uh, but we can live in the freedom of the Father by His Spirit. And, and, and that's basically what I want to talk to you about today. I've been reading this book. It's by Dr. Warren Wiersbe, and it's called Be Right. And basically, it's a, it's a, um, talks about Paul's epistle uh, to the Romans. Uh, and it's really an amazing thing because he actually writes a big series on a bunch of different uh, epistles in the New Testament. And so uh, from Paul. Uh, but this particular one explains how mankind is in a fallen state and it's only through faith in the finished work of Jesus we can be made right with God. So the book of Romans reveals the brokenness of humanity due to sin and, and, and from sin came the fall of man. And, and as it also reveals through the blood of Jesus and the forgiveness of sins. Um, we have been declared righteous and right in the sight of God. And so the issue, uh, though, is it's not about just what God sees because he sees us being amazing. He, he's got his eyes that are so fixed upon us and the amazing thing that he accomplished for us. So he sees some amazing things in us. So it's not even just about what he sees, though. It's about him, us coming in agreement with what he sees and receiving that salvation through what? Justification. And what is justification? Justification is as simple as this. Just as if I never sinned. Okay. So justification is basically when we see salvation, it's just as if we never missed the mark in the first place. It's just as if Adam never ate from the tree. That's beautiful. Because we go back to the beginning and to the start of when all this began. Isn't that awesome? That's pretty sweet. And then also we have the continuation of the pursuit of Christ's likeness, which is what we call through sanctification. And, and that process is daily. That process is every day as we wake up, when we go to sleep, we're constantly trying to grow and mature in the things of Christ to become more like him. And so, but the only way we can maintain this pursuit and be on the track of Christ likeness is through the power and the ability of the Holy Spirit. So in the seventh chapter of the book uh, from uh, Dr. Wearsby, it begins the discussion about Romans chapter eight, which in most circles is proclaimed as the declaration of freedom. OK, so when you study this chapter, talking about uh, uh, the chapter uh, of Romans, it shows the importance and the emphasis on the Holy Spirit. And it's actually mentioned about 19 times in the chapter. So that's pretty awesome. The first paragraph of the chapter in the book, Be Right, reads as such. On January 6, 1941, uh, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt addressed uh, Congress on the state of the war in Europe. Much of what he said that day has been forgotten, unfortunately. But at the close of his address, he said that he looked forward to, in quotes, a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. And then he names them. Freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. I really like those, those four areas, because they are actually not only human freedoms, but they can also represent some spiritual freedoms as a believer in the Lord Jesus. Don't you agree? So what? So why freedom? It's because the Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 3.17, that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Or if we read it in the Passion Translation, it reads like this, and I'll actually start at verse 16. But the moment one turns to the Lord with an open heart, the veil is lifted and they see. 
Verse 17, now the Lord I'm referring to is the Holy Spirit. And wherever he is Lord, there is freedom. Isn't that awesome? It's where the Holy Spirit is being Lorded in that place. So if he's Lord in me, that's where my freedom comes. Okay. If he's Lord in your life, that's where your freedom comes. That means you're making him the top priority of your life. He's the one that owns you. He's the one that directs you. He's the one that gives you uh, uh, clarity in your life. It's through the Holy Spirit. Isn't that powerful? So who is he? He is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God. The Holy Spirit is not a it. He's not a mist. He's not a vapor. He is a person. And he and that person being the Holy Spirit, he wants to have a relationship with you through the Holy Spirit. He can connect you to the father and have that father, son, father, daughter relationship back again. Isn't that powerful? That's pretty awesome. So looking at those four human freedoms from Roosevelt, how can we as believers in Jesus Christ live in those same freedoms from a spiritual perspective by the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit? That's how. Isn't that powerful? So what is freedom? Webster's Dictionary basically says that freedom is exemption or liberation from the control of some other person or some arbitrary power. It means liberty and independence. It also means to be able to act or move and be used, uh, etc., without any hindrances or restrictions or restraints. So basically what God wants to do through that word freedom, he wants to be able to use you, to move you, and to be able to allow you to act uh, on the prompting of his spirit in your life. So that's freedom, okay? So let's right now, let's go into uh, one of the four uh, human freedoms that um, that we spoke of of Roosevelt. And the first one is freedom of speech. And this is known as the cornerstone of our U.S. democracy. But as you see in the picture, uh, it's called freedom of speech. And it's a man, uh, looks like a man that, that uh, he's about to release the, his right to speak. And it looks like he's going to speak on the behalf of a, of a, a sect of people that may uh, lack the resources and, and the esteem of the majority, but he is using his freedom to stand and speak. But the, the thing is, this usually deals with man's opinions and ideas. Uh, most people feel and believe that this concept um, is all about being able to say whatever you want to say and whatever is on your mind and, and not receive any repercussions of that um, from those words that you speak. And it usually has to deal with a little bit of uh, anger, uh, has to deal with a little bit of wrath and, um, and frustration usually. Um, but let's look at what the Bible says about that. Okay, when we want to just use our speech for just frustration and wrath. James chapter 1, verse 19 through 21, and it says this, My dearest brothers and sisters, take this to heart. He's getting he's serious. Be quick to listen, but slow to speak. And be slow to become angry. For human anger is never a legitimate tool to promote God's righteous purpose. So this is why we abandon everything morally impure and all forms of wicked conduct. Instead, with a sensitive spirit, we absorb God's word, which has been implanted within our nature. Check that out. So his word has been planted into our new nature. Okay, this is our new nature now. This is not the old fallen nature and the sinful nature. This is a new nature that we have because for the word of life, check this out. It has the power to continually deliver you and to deliver us. So if you look at this from the perspective of, of what we have become and the transformation that we've come by his word, by his spirit, it brings freedom to us. So now not only it frees us, now in reciprocation, we now bring freedom to other people. Okay, because that same word that delivered us, that word of life, now we have the ability to speak life now to others. So when we think of speech, uh, it's a word that comes from speak, which deals with words. So, so, so I want you to write this down. When you speak, it sparks. I want you to say that. When I speak, it sparks. And, and, the, and the question is, what is it sparking? Okay, it ignites something either in people, okay? It ignites either frustration or anger, okay? 
or or it brings life. It ignites the life in them. Okay, and it changes the atmosphere. I, I think of the late Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, his speech, I Have a Dream speech, and what he spoke that day set something in motion. Okay, and it is still felt to this day from generation to generation uh, because of what he spoke, he sparked. Okay, so we got to look at this from being not only just a foundational deal for for U.S. democracy or freedom of speech in that perspective, but we can look at it from a foundation and spiritual cornerstone in the kingdom of God. So words, write this down, and speaking are the foundation of creation and for our created purpose. In the book of Genesis, God created the existence of everything we see by what he spoke. And he also commanded Adam to speak and name the animals that he created. Let me look, let's read it in Genesis chapter two, verse 19. So the Lord God formed from the ground, all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to, to man or to Adam to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each of them. Isn't that powerful? The man chose the name. God didn't choose the name for people. Now he said horse, <laughs> okay, cow moo, type thing. You know what I mean? So it was the man that spoke and things came to life. So you see, sometimes there may be some things in your life, okay, that God may bring to you and you have the privilege to choose what you're going to say to that situation. Wow, look how powerful this is. You have the choice now to name your situation. Sometimes your situation doesn't look like it has life, but you can speak life. You can look, your situation looks like there's no healing, but you can speak healing. Because you have power in your words. So will you speak death or will you speak life? Will you speak fear or will you speak faith? I love it. The song says way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. You know what's so cool about that? You know, God is saying that to us. God is saying you are a way maker because here, here this revelation. He makes a way, but sometimes he wants to make a way by what you say. Go on, write that, write that down, write that down. He wants to make a way, but it comes from what you say. Okay? So here's my last thought on freedom of speech. It's the reality to speak the word of God with boldness by the power of the spirit. And this thought comes from Acts chapter 4, verses 29 through 31. And it starts actually the middle of their prayer time after they have been persecuted for the gospel's sake. And it reads this in verse 29. So now, Lord, listen to their threats to harm us empower us as your servants to speak the word of God. Check this out freely and courageously. Stretch out your hand of power through us to heal. See, he wants to do it through us. He wants to do it through you and to move in signs and wonders by the name of your holy son, Jesus. Verse 31. And at that moment, the earth shook beneath them, causing the building they were in to tremble. Each one of them was filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to proclaim the word of God with unrestrained boldness. When we talked about freedom, it's unrestrained without any hindrances. They pray that say, God, we want this on our life. We want to be filled with your spirit so much that we can speak your word boldly. Freedom of speech, freedom of speech. So ask the Lord, ask him and say, Blow in me, God. Blow your spirit in me. Come like you did on the day of Pentecost. Come like you did as they were praying and shake your people with your, your, with your presence. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So let's now talk about the next human freedom, uh, which we can tie into the spiritual freedoms that we can walk in as believers. And this one is called the freedom to worship. Okay, I love this. I love this. And this is uh, this is very, very, uh, very, very uh, specific and very significant. Okay, so here, here it is. Th this particular freedom, according to our U.S. democracy, it pertains to religious freedom and for people to worship uh, according to their religious beliefs and practices. Right. So right now th there's a picture up there. Let's look at the picture called uh, freedom to worship. And we see different races different genders, ages, and colors standing together for prayer and worship, which I feel is just amazing and it's awesome and I love it. 
but the only thing is, is what it says actually on the picture. You can read it there. And it says this, each according to the dictates of his own conscience. Each according to the dictates of his own conscience. So basically it is saying to each his own or, or just be free to do or worship uh, just the way you feel is right according to your own conscience or how you worship or whatever. And I get that in one sense, but but there's a lot of off roads to that reality. Don't you agree? The issue is what is the issue is this is that the conscience is very deceiving. It can be very deceiving. And so so I want to read something. It's actually in 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 First Timothy and it's four one and two, and it reads like this: The Holy Spirit has explicitly revealed. At the end of this age, many will depart from the, check this out, the true faith. Okay, so if he's talking about a true faith, there must be a false faith too. So something that that is looks like the thing, but it's not the thing. And he said there will be many that will depart from it one after another, devoting themselves to spirits of deception and following demon inspired revelations and theories. Wow. It says this in verse two, hypocritical liars will deceive many and their consciences won't even bother them at all. So he's saying that these people that are that are deceiving people and bringing them over, their conscience is not even serious. They're just going about what they're doing. OK, and there's no uh, um, convictions or anything. Their conscience is just seared. That's what the, the King James says. The Bible also reads in, in Hebrews 9, 14, and it says this, it says, yet how much more would the sacred blood of the Messiah thoroughly cleanse our conscience? So there was a cleansing, not only just of the, you know, the spirit, you know, of sin and things like that, but our conscience can be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Okay. For the power of the eternal spirit. Here we go. It's by the spirit. He offered himself to God as the perfect sacrifice that now frees us. There's that freedom thing. It frees us from our dead works, okay, to worship and to serve the living God. So what he's saying is there was a cleansing and a transformation that can free us from the dead works of our conscience. So now we can live freely with a good conscience towards God. And now we can worship and serve the living God. And there's only one true God, right? He's Jehovah, right? He's Jehovah. And so I love that. So so, so the main difference uh, and that separates us as Christians or as Christ followers is, is this. You can write this down. We don't worship God due to being a part of a religion. We worship out of relationship with a loving father. Okay. We worship out of relationship with a loving father. Uh, and Jesus said it this way in John 4, 23 and 24. From here on, okay, worshiping the father will not be a matter of the right place but with the right heart for God is a spirit and he longs to have sincere worshipers who worship and adore him in the realm of the spirit and in truth. Man, that's powerful. I love that scripture. So basically he's saying there is a deeper place that we can go into with God. And it's not just the place we are, the place we're going to, or, or, or it's the church we're in, but it's a spiritual perspective that we can go deep into the realm of the spirit and in truth, the reality of truth in our life that he wants us to worship in. And he saw, he calls that sincere, true worship. Okay. So, so if we want to define worship, what is worship? Uh, uh, one meaning of worship actually is in, according to the, to the Hebrew, um, is to depress or prostrate in homage to royalty or God, which means actually to lower or flatten. Okay, this is in the area of posture and position. So sometimes, you know, there, there's a time where, you know, where I'm even in prayer and worship and I actually lay on my face. I actually lay prostrate on my face. Okay, and some people say, well, you know, that's a little deep. You know, maybe I just do it, you know, in my own way, which is fine and that's good and, I, and that's awesome. But to, lay, to prostrate literally means to lie face down in demonstration of humility or submission. Uh, there are times in, uh, during our um, during our time in prayer and our worship that it will be demonstrated with our physical body. Okay, if it's not lifting our hands or whatever. But but I, I thought of this, just like baptism is an outward demonstration 
of an inward reality. And that's what it is. And that's what our praise and worship is. That's exactly what our praise and worship is. It can be expressed outwardly. Okay. It can be an outward demonstration of an inward reality. So that transformation that we have in God can be demonstrated outwardly in our praise and our worship. You know, that is different with everybody, with the lifting of hands, with the song that we sing or whatever it is. Okay. But you and I know those folks that say, you know, hey, I, I worship God in my heart. So they sit there, okay, and I just worship God in my heart, which is fine. I promise you, it's, I'm not mad or anything, right? I'm not mad or anything. But what I'm saying is, is that sometimes the Bible says out of the heart, the mouth will speak. Or I say it this way, out of your heart, your life will speak. Okay, some things in your life will actually speak what's in your heart. So, and, and, and that, that actually verse is in Matthew chapter 12, 30, uh, uh, verse 34. So what is in your heart, okay, if it's an abundance of his goodness and his grace in our life. So with that amount of goodness and grace from our father, we can't keep it contained in just our heart. We have to express it in the form of praise and worship and our life itself because worship becomes a lifestyle. Okay. So, so here, here's the last thing I want to say. And, and this pertains to just praise in itself. Praise in the Hebrew actually has eight different meanings. And that's a whole different study that we're not going to get into today. But I will just read the words, okay? So, so check this out. These are, these are the words. Hallel, Yada, Barak, Tehila, Zemar, Toda, Shabak, and Hallelujah, which that's the universal uh, uh, praise uh, word. So all those words, you'll, you'll see them on the screen there. All those words are different words of praise and they all have different meanings but that's a whole different study we don't get into right now so bless god so this is the freedom to worship and that's what we have right now hey guys i hope you enjoyed uh the teaching this week um on the, the freedom of the resurrected spirit filled life so uh this is oreo has been hanging out uh so i hope you enjoyed it tune in next week and we'll definitely be uh, be uh, digging in a little bit more to to the teaching. So uh, we love you guys, and uh, we just pray that you uh, continue to just uh, grow and continue just to love Jesus. Okay, even during this uh, hard time that we're going through right now. We love you guys. Bless you. Have a great day.